I'm bringing a part two. <clears throat> so I shared about the sower and the seed. It's linked to the dream I had. The Lord had given me chapter 13 in Matthew. Having read the scriptures, that chapter, to seek an answer for the once saved, always saved comment. The Lord gave me this scripture to put to death all the comments from this flesh that is holding up the wedding. This is the grace, this is the grace period that people are talking about that the Lord is allowing us. How long do we want to hold this wedding up? How long are you going to drag your feet? You, you honour him with your words, you pay lip service, but your hearts are wicked and you are holding up the bride. This is your redemption. This is your saviour who will come. We need the bride to be ready. Stay off her case. Join her or stay off her case. Put the flesh to death. So those men and women who the groom holds back his wrath for, The bride says, this is a suggestion. <laughs> the Lord hears our suggestions. Let's agree that a day of the wedding is put off. But let's just go and marry now in the accommodation. This was, in this dream, a small wedding. The road is narrow and few will find it. The numbers are getting smaller and smaller as each day goes by. He is separating the sheep from the goats. He is pulling up the net and sorting the fish, the good from the bad. He is blotting out the names of people in the book of life. He is sorting the wheat from the tears. He is going to throw in the fire. And the chaff will be burnt up. The flesh hovers. It hovers over the waters. The waters are the seam, is semen. That is the root word of that. The semen, that is the seed of man. It's the flesh of man. This fleshy, leathery serpent that clothes us all with corruptible bodies. I know it's in the way. I know it's in a way. I know, I know that the men and women are in the way. The flesh is in the way. But let no man, as I said, let no man separate what God has joined together. The two become one flesh, so they no longer are two, but one flesh. Now the Lord has directed me to Mark 10. I've got my scriptures there. The 
because when I think of this, the flesh, the leathery flesh, this leathery serpent that clothes us, we call this the, a body, but it came from Satan. Satan is our enemy, and the fruit of him is the flesh, which is our enemy too. Yes, the flesh is wicked, but it's not the wicked that we fight. It is the devil whom we fight. So just before I go to work, I'm hoping I can show you some scriptures. So, I can't read them. I'm sorry, I can't flip it. So you've got Matthew 13. The sower and the seed. And the Lord has shown me. Matthew 8. Putting the flesh to death. And then when I was just writing this edition, this last part. He brought me full circle before I brought my words from Jonathan Clegg. And I, I know that nobody's watching them. And that is your mistake. That is your mistake. That is your offence. The flesh is fended. Because it is arrogant, it is proud, and it doesn't want to believe that it's been believing a lie. But how easy is it to deceive the flesh? The flesh listens to its father, Satan. It hears him. It is only by the spirit that you discern. That's how easy it is for you to be deceived. And you've been deceived about Genesis 1 and 2. And you are being deceived also who do not believe that the Bible is changing. So I've come full circle to the word that True Shock TV brought and the scripture that shocked me and should shock you is that now our enemy, Ephesians 6, this you do need to see in case you are flesh is too lazy and you don't look can you see how the word has been changed from wicked to wicked from the devil that our enemy is the wicked which is the flesh Yes, our enemy is the flesh, but the true enemy is the creator of the flesh, the devil. And that's who we fight. <clears throat> so, this is what you need in this end time. You need to know these things. You need to seek God for revelation and ask him to confirm it. You need to therefore take unto you the whole armour of God that ye may be able excuse me that ye may be able look I'm going to go back to 12 because it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places therefore take unto you the whole armor of god that ye may be able to withstand in this evil day and having done all stand stand therefore having your loins girt with the truth i'm sharing the truth and having on that breastplate of righteousness romans 8 
and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How can you save others if you can't save yourself, if you don't actually have the gospel to bring? And above all, taking the shield of faith, therefore ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil, not the wicked. (coughs) I am not affected by your words. Flesh, I, they, they know I have, I have a soft heart, but God guards my heart. I have put my trust in the Lord. I have gone through persecutions and trials. I have lost everything in this world and I'm full of joy. Like I said, How can things get worse but get better? Just like the Apostle said. Consider it pure joy when trial and persecution comes. So I'm going to go to Genesis 1 and 2. I've already showed you that the Māori people here know the truth. And they sneaked it into the Bible. Have a look. So in Genesis 1... And I did a Māori language course. It says, Nā te atua, small a, which means plural, the gods created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to put the te atua, capital A, because that's all they could get away with, because the missionaries... They they got that past the missionaries. They knew the truth. They worshipped the gods of creation. That's the truth. Genesis 2 is where the Lord God supplanted the system. And I just thought I would go there because there are two things that I brought up in the word. And that's that... The spirit of Elohim hovered over the waters, which is that leathery, long right, long white cloud that the Māori people talk about. This that leathery serpent, and then in Genesis two, the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye have, God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Ye have, God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Doubt. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. We know this story. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, I'll go there, and the serpent said unto the woman, so I need my glasses, I'm sorry, that you shall not surely die. He lied, he's lying to you. You think you can eat of the flesh and not die? You think you can still live eternity in heaven and eat of the flesh? You're believing the serpent, you can't. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Woe, because your eyes were not opened, your eyes were closed. You have had, from that day on, we had scales on our eyes. 
ye shall not be as gods. Ye are pawns in the system. It is a lie. So anyway, when <coughs> Eve saw this tree, she desired it. She took the fruit thereof. And she gave it to her husband, and he ate it. And both of them, their eyes were opened. They saw their shame. I eat snakes of shame. That's what Romans 8 is. But the point is that in Genesis 3, 7, and you need to go to Click for his teaching. They sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves aprons. They made themselves coverings. The serpent's skin, the serpent's skin covers the flesh. It hides us. It hides us from God. It gets between us and God. It needs to be put to death. We need to shed our skin. <laughs> but the important thing that the Lord showed me just as I went back to Genesis, just to point this out, was Genesis 2, 24. Did I mention the marriage? Oh, it must be. It's Matthew 10. I'll just, I'll go to it. I didn't mark it. Matthew 9 is good too. I must have screenshot on my phone. I didn't find it in the Bible. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so basically it's the questions that the people asked Jesus about divorce. And he said, he quoted the scripture. And it's in Genesis 2 where he says, Therefore shall no man... Leave his father, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Nakedness is the spiritual man, the spiritual man. The man that walks and talks with, <coughs> with his holy father in the call of the day, the spiritual man. There is no shame. Because the work of grace, the acceptance, the relationship, the intimacy, the closeness, the honesty between you and God is complete. Like the, like the relationship was in the garden, it is complete. It is finished. But many that say it is finished still don't know that. They are in the flesh. How do we discern? The spiritual man discerneth 
and judge of all things. The root word is anacrino. They turn it up. The Lord Jesus Christ come to bring division. The other thing I need to mention is, and I will say it, you have on your shores in America a church that's come from, I think it's Sweden, the Lord showed me last year, called the Last Reformation. They propose that they are doers of the word and they are like a manifestation of the book of Acts, the Acts Church. <coughs> yes, we desire to do the things that the disciples did. But the bride desires God's best and God's best is not the flesh. When we go out in the flesh to do the work of God, before he calls us into a glorious body, Satan has a field game and he will follow you with signs and wonders. But there will be no true conversions. I know and I can discern that these are bitter, offended, rejected souls that run this ministry. In the 90s, the Lord God bought a move of his Holy Spirit. We call it the ro laughing revival, the holy rollers. <coughs> and we say, the, the coin phrase is, more Lord, more. It, it glorifies the Holy Spirit. And there's something wrong with that. With submitting to God. Getting under his glory cloud. These people in this ministry are putting up posts. Especially... Especially, they did it last year, and they've just put another one up. To, to grieve the Holy Ghost, to grieve the Holy Spirit. It is a grave, grave sin. It is a grave, grave sin. These people participated in faking, they faked manifestations of the spirit to fit in because the Lord God wasn't touching them because their hearts were hard because they were in the flesh in the intellect and in the mind now you, you do not seek after the manifestations of the spirit but when you touch God's heart and his presence is on you you may feel your spiritual man your spiritual man bears witness to his spirit and it is it is a wonderful confirmation it is a wonderful encouragement it is a foretaste of what's to come your senses are awake you sense the holy ghost you shake under the spirit of God. You weep, you cry, and the Lord teaches you. Also, he can teach you through the way in which if you submit to the Holy Spirit, the way in which you move and which people will saw as manifestations. Now, I can tell you now for a fact, and I never knew it back then, that some of them were fake. And this was a criticism. But the people who faked it were sabotaging it. They are now still discouraging people because they know that the Holy Spirit is 
the teacher, the counselor, and will lead us into all truth. If he can separate, if they can separate us and bring us to a place of fleshly caution, not spiritual discernment, just fleshly caution, fear, 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 it's fear. It's fear of the devil, it's unbelief. We must trust the Lord. Trust the Lord will not give us. What good father, like that was what was brought brought back in those back then. What good father would give a stone to a child who asks for a fish? They don't know God. They don't know God. So what I'm saying is please go before God and ask him. I did this. I did this last year. And the Lord confirmed it. And he confirmed it by showing me these people from the last Reformation. The flesh hates it. Jesus came to bring division and an offense. Here's an offense. And people who, people, it's like, it's like the, <clears throat> the, the brother of the prodigal son. He, he couldn't understand why he wasn't being blessed. And he had to justify himself. It's the flesh. And the spirit resists the flesh. I'm not saying that you you have to experience. <clears throat> I don't understand. I don't understand those that can't that don't experience the presence of God. I honestly don't. I don't want to come to the place where I would say that those who who do not experience the presence of God when they enter and when they even think on him, I just think on him and I sense his presence. My hand buzzes now all the time. My feet buzz cuz they are shod with the Gospel salvation. And when he speaks, I have a tangible presence come over me that goes straight into my spirit and I know that it's from God. My spirit bears witness. And I am an example of fruit. When I first come to the Lord, it was in 1994 in February. And the Spirit was manifest from day one. Then a year later, I think across the globe, something was happening in Toronto and we had a visit from different ministers who'd been under that ministry and to, we had a visit uh, to Dunedin I was saved in the Elam church and then when I went to Christchurch John Arnott came to Majestic House in the in the city and it was a um, New Life Church I think and I went there and I had been two years married so this was at least three years into my walk as a Christian I was in a situation where Satan had trapped me into a marriage with a man who was pretending to be Christian, pretending to recommit his life to the Lord. And <clears throat> as soon as I entered that marriage, he told me he didn't want children, and to the lead up he did. And I prayed and I learned so much in God about how to be a godly wife and to lay down my lay down all my burdens at his feet but when he said my husband that he was going to leave Christchurch and I had already been called in a dream and I knew what I was to do here I said I would leave him and I, I came back to Christchurch he was trying to get us to live in Dunedin that husband of mine didn't want to give me children because my children are chosen he didn't want to give them to me but the Lord impressed on him when I left him 
and I was at this aunt meeting. <clears throat> I was living um, with my daughter because I was a single mum when I was saved. Just in a single bed. I was boarding. He and him, the Lord touched him and he had no choice. He did hear him and he came to Christchurch and met me. We had no cell phones back then, but he just showed up at this meeting because that's where he knew I was. And I came back from prayer, from being filled with the Holy Ghost in this Arnott meeting, and he said, I, the Lord has put it on my heart to cherish you and Amy, which was my daughter, and his daughter, he was her stepfather. And I didn't think... I didn't think anything. I, I didn't respond in the flesh. Like, my flesh was happy. But I was in the spirit. And I prophesied. And I said, it will be a boy. And we will call him Joshua. Because he said he wanted to start a family. And that was the word of the Lord. That night we slept in a wee, squeaky, single bed. And Joshua was conceived. I think that was 1996 or 1997. Oh, I know when he was conceived. It was 1997. December 29th. He's turns 21 now. I've got a few more minutes. Are you enjoying my testimony? So this man, again, the Lord witnesses to him that he has a wife who is honouring her marriage covenant and putting the Lord God first. That is what honouring your marriage covenant is. That is the only way that you can have a marriage that survives. I did my part as I put the Lord God first. Now, not always. I have been lukewarm. I understand this place. So after I gave birth to Joshua, we found a church. We were at a nice wee church. <clears throat> and I was always going before the Lord, um, asking him to give me the strength to love this man who now was... He was faithless. To, to live with it where man who has no faith is a difficult thing and many are going through that and I lived that way for eight years <clears throat> but I I went to the altar and I laid down sin I had been very um, I thought premenstrual a little bit I was it was getting too much for me resisting this sort of like a uh, a bitchy, nasty type of behavior that was manifesting. And I went and I laid that before the Lord and asked him for strength. And the pastor prayed and she said to me, you are pregnant. And it went straight into my heart and I knew it. And it was on a Sunday. And on the Monday I booked and met with my husband and my two children at a clinic for a pregnancy test. I sat on the off the bench, the the, doc, the nurse's bench. And I remember it vividly. I knew I was pregnant. The test, you, your own test, I don't know if they're the same in other parts of the country, but it's either a line, a negative, or a plus, a positive. The test was a red line negative. The time had passed for it to have shown up. I had no dis disappointment. And this is a way in which the Lord communicates. I had, had the heat. I had heat on my head. And a weight on me. Like a glory weight on me. That and meant I could not leave. I didn't want to leave. And I knew the Lord was saying, wait. Wait. My husband's impatient, he's grabbing the children, he's obviously annoyed with me for dragging him down there. 
the nurse is packing everything away and then she goes to the bench and she checks it again before it goes in the bin and it's a positive. I felt really bad because I I had I don't it was wrong for me to be, feel bad but I just thought well I'm going to let my husband name this baby because the Lord God named Joshua. So I went through baby names because he didn't take the time to do it but I you know what woman um it it's a good thing it's it's how we're made we're made this way as a helpmate so I had the baby books we didn't have computers and I just read names and I read names that I approved of and there were like a good hundred and something names there were just some that I just couldn't live with <laughs> people I'd known that were nasty I didn't want my children named after them and as I was reading them, he said, Emily sounds beautiful. Emily, I've got a great grandmother called Emily. It's a family name, he said, and he's English. So we went with Emily. But then when she was born, another lady who'd been in church had heard from the Lord early when I first had found out I was pregnant. And I think I shared my testimony about how the Lord gave me a witness and told me to wait for the test. So she knew that, and she said, to me after the Lord had brought Emily forth <laughs> that the Lord had told her that I would call her Emily I I believe that lady so I know that the Lord God named both my children and I have time to share about my first baby that I had outside of wedlock when I was saved I was a single mum now I named her Cole Ruby, so it's K-O-H-L Ruby, R-U-B-Y. Now it's another story why I named her that, but I'm telling you now that it was, it's ended up a sign in my story before I be, had begun my testimony, before I was saved. The Lord God saved us both. But two years later when I was married or maybe courting my husband when I was born again, I walked across the hallway in the room that we were married and the Lord said quite clearly to me, call her Amy. Amy means love. I changed her name to Amy. Amy's a big part of my testimony and, and she is named by God too. God names us. Look up the meaning of your name. <laughs> 